An important theme of my research is how personalized recommendations and similar algorithms affect consumer choice. Uh, we are all flooded by product choices today, and uh, these kinds of personalized recommendations play an important role in helping us discover new products or sorting through large uh, choice sets. And uh, we see uh, personalized recommendations in a number of industries, whether it's in retail, for example, Amazon, so people who bought this also bought this, or in media, such as in Netflix or, or YouTube. Uh, we see it with news as well. For example, Google News will recommend personalized news stories. Uh, and we know they have a pretty significant impact on consumer choice. Uh, for example, at Amazon, they drive anywhere from a quarter to a third of the choices that consumers make online. Uh, so although we know that they have a big impact on consumer choice, we don't fully understand what kinds of products uh, are more likely to be uh, accepted by consumers when recommended, and when do recommenders work well and when they don't. Uh, so in my research with uh, Professor Dokian Lee at Carnegie Mellon, uh, we uh, look at two main questions. Uh, the first is, what kinds of products are uh, more likely to benefit from recommendations? Uh, specifically, are mainstream products or niche products more likely to benefit uh, from recommendations? And the other question we look at is, what is it about a product that's, that makes it more likely to uh, elicit a response from a consumer when it's recommended? For example, the ratings of the products or the price of the product or the type of the product, do they influence whether recommendations are effective for that product? So in one of our research studies, we look at whether recommendation systems help us discover novel and niche items that we might not otherwise discover, but are a great fit for us personally. Uh, what we find in our study is that because common recommendation systems are based on sales and ratings, for example, you know, people who bought this also bought this, they're unable to surface truly novel items that have not been discovered by many other people. Uh, and this tends to create a rich gets richer effect for popular items. And it might also prevent consumers from finding a better uh, product matches because of this bias for items that have been purchased by others or that have been rated well uh, by others. Now this uh, is a finding that a lot of people find surprising because many friends tell me that they do find uh, very new items that they previously did not know about through recommendations. And in line with that, we find that uh, these recommendation recommendation systems can push us as individuals to new items, but they push all of us towards the same new items, and thus at the aggregate level, we don't see this great increase in diversity of uh, purchases from consumers. So in another research study, we looked at what is it about a product that makes it more likely to elicit a response from a consumer when it's recommended. For example, we looked at interactions between a product's rating uh, and the recommendation response. And we find that, uh, as one would expect, uh, recommendations help all kinds of products, whether they're rated high or whether they're rated low. But interestingly, we find that it's the products that have a low average ratings that elicit a, a greater response from the consumer. That is, the purchase probability of a product goes up a lot more when for lower rated products than high ra higher rated products. And this uh, tells us that recommendations and ratings are in some way substitutes. So if a product has high ratings to begin with, then the recommendation has an impact, but it's not as great. But when it has low ratings, uh, you know, in the absence of the recommendation, we might not even respond to that product. But when that product is recommended, then we are willing to give the product the benefit of doubt. Maybe the product isn't right for everyone out there, but perhaps it's right for me. And so we find that recommendations and ratings can be substitutes um, as well. Uh, another aspect we looked at is whether uh, the type of the product matters. So we classified all the products in our data set into what we call utilitarian products and hedonic products. So utilitarian, utilitarian products are products that serve some functional purpose, uh, for example, appliances or groceries. And hedonic products are products that don't serve a functional purpose and really appeal to some sensory uh, perception, for example, jewelry. And we found that recommendations have a you know, low to moderate impact for utilitarian products. But it is for the hedonic products that they have a very significant impact. And these hedonic products, you know, things like jewelry, 
where we don't really need it and when a recommendation kind of suggests that this is a great fit for us or people with similar tastes like this product, that really moves the needle in terms of making us respond to that recommendation. Uh, we look at other things like you know the description of the product matters, the price does it matter, and you and we find what you would expect. You know, uh, people respond to recommendations for lower price products than higher price products, and where there's better description uh, for the product than if there's very limited description. So there were two uh, conclusions that surprised us that we didn't uh, expect a priori. One was that recommendations don't uh, necessarily help us uh, discover niche products. And that is interesting because there has been a lot of discussion for at least a decade now about how online systems, whether it's search engines or personalized recommendations, they will help us find niche items and they will help benefit you know, what we call the long tail, the, the products that are not super popular, that uh, almost don't get produced, uh, that may get produced but don't really sell much. And the promise of recommendation systems is they really give uh, a, a fair opportunity for these kinds of products. And we find that for the common designs, it doesn't happen. Um, and that's pretty surprising. There are some designs where you, you make design modifications and you favor niche items, you can make it work. But most common designs that are used at most retailers, they don't do that. And we found that you know, it might have uh, the opposite effect. Now, another result that surprised us was that recommendations and ratings are substitutes. Uh, again, a priori, we expected that uh, you know, people will respond to recommendations when they are highly rated. And we did find that when they're highly rated, people respond to recommendations. But what surprised us was that their response is even greater when the products have a lower rating. And so that suggests that uh, there's this uh, effect of recommendations as substitutes for ratings. Uh, and we hadn't predicted that uh, beforehand. So our research has implications for retailers, for producers, and even consumers. Uh, for retailers, to the extent that their strategy is to offer a wide product assortment, it, our research suggests that the choices of technology they make may not always be consistent with that strategy, and they need to think harder about the technology choices. For example, Amazon's strategy is that you can find any product on Earth at Amazon, and really wide product assortment is its strategy. Similarly, many online retailers also offer uh, wide product assortment. So our research suggests that uh, if you offer great product assortment, you also need to think about how will consumers discover that wide product assortment. And recommendations are an important part of the solution, but they don't often work in practice because they have this bias towards products that have been bought before and that have been rated uh, before. And so our research suggests that they need to think about technology choice and think about how to modify these common designs so it, it is consistent with their uh, product uh, choices in general. Uh, for producers, you know, our research shows that recommendations and similar algorithms, they drive consumer choice in a big way. So producers need to think hard about how they get discovered by these algorithms. Uh, today, producers are used to thinking about how, do a, how does our product get discovered by consumers. They need to also ask how, do, how does our product get discovered by algorithms. And for consumers, we find that these systems are great at helping us as individuals discover new products. But at the aggregate level, we're not seeing that diversity which is not necessarily troublesome for consumers, but it does suggest that there are products out there that could be this needle in the haystack perfect product for you, uh, which may not be surfaced by recommendations. So one has to be open to other uh, sources of discovery as well. So there's a lot of talk these days about big data and analytics and how there's so much data and companies are building intelligent algorithms that can help them be smart, that can help consumers find products they like and so on. And our research shows that these efforts do work, but at the same time, 
uh, we have to be cautious about unintended consequences. So for example, the idea of recommendations is that they help us find novel items, but we don't want them to have biases built into them where they favor certain kinds of items versus others. And to the extent they favor certain kinds of items, that might have an unintended consequence. And we can think about that, say, in the context of news. If we all consume news through personalized recommendations, we may not always get that breadth of perspective we want. And so algorithms might be driving a lot of our choice with media, and we need to think hard about how big data and algorithms can uh, be de-biased. And, and largely they work, but they do have some biases we need to be cautious about. So one of the things that's really novel about our work is that uh, our research is informed by a really large-scale data and analysis of that data. There have been a lot of theories about how recommendations impact consumer choice, what kinds of products they favor, when consumers respond to them, and so on. Uh, in practice, there had been very little empirical evidence. And that's partly because uh, f in order to answer these questions, for example, do they favor niche items or mainstream items, we need a contrast between people exposed to recommendations and unexposed to recommendations. And for most retailers, they observe consumers only after they come to their website and are exposed to recommendations. And so our study is based on uh, and, and an experiment that was done with a large uh, retailer in North America with whom we ran an A-B experiment where some people got recommendations, some did not, and we ran this for hundreds of different product categories. And so we were able to not only get that contrast needed to answer the question, but we were also able to generalize be beyond a single product category because we had so many different products. Uh, and that, I think, is one of the things that sets this research apart, which is that it's based on data, it's based on concrete evidence, and it's based on a large enough sample point and a large, very representative sample of consumers. So in terms of next steps, we're trying to generalize some of our results beyond recommendations and think about all kinds of search tools we have online. And so they include social tools and social news feeds. For example, on Facebook, we discover products. It includes search engines. We're also trying to understand this uh, world from the producer's perspective. As I mentioned, uh, you know, there are implications for producers, and producers need to think hard about how uh, consumers will discover their products through algorithms. And so they need to think about discovery by the algorithms as well. Uh, and there's very limited understanding of what is it about a product that makes a recommendation pick that product among thousands of potential candidates. Uh, and so we're trying to study that and hopefully we'll provide some insights to producers so that they can be active participants in helping their products get discovered rather than passive observers.